Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Good morning, everyone. Let's start in prayer. Father, thank you for this beautiful day. Thank you for the sunshine. And Father, I just keep thinking how that must have been that morning when there was an empty tomb. When sadness and despair turned into joy. When fear turned into belief. That we have a risen Savior. That you have defeated death through your son Jesus Christ and there is no sting in death. You've taken it all away for those who choose to believe. We thank you for choosing to love us so frivolously, Father. So unconditionally. May your spirit be upon this place today and just have us to listen to what the spirit tells us. And not only listen, but be doers of the word as well. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So this week I have been thinking about Easter a lot. And it's nice having the beautiful weather that makes you think that much more. You see the growth and the beauty. But we've got a tree in our yard that is, keeps leaning. It leans a little further and further. It leans right towards our barn and right towards the horses. So all my pretty grass on the other pasture that I was waiting to get higher, I had to move my horses over to that. And I'm like, don't eat all my grass up yet because I want it to grow. But it is beautiful um, this time of year. And I keep thinking that, wow, what God did for us. Not only did He love us enough to create us, not only did He love us enough to send Jesus to die for us, but we have that hope that is beyond anything we can imagine, that Jesus rose from the dead, that He defeated death so that we could have life. And that life begins on this earth now, not just when we go to be with Him forever, but we have that victory now through Jesus Christ that He defeated sin, that we don't have to live a life anymore that is condemned and held captive by sin, but we have the power to defeat sin through Jesus Christ and the Spirit that He gave us. We've talked about the prodigal son for the last few weeks, and I want to reiterate on that a little bit and say that, you know, there's nothing that unusual about the sons in the story because we all have children, we were all children, that took time to rebel. And yes, Jesus gave a story where we said, with the young son, we said, wow, how can he be this bad? How can he be this selfish? How can he be this worried about things of this world rather than the love of his father? But we all do that. We all say that we want this or that. We deserve this or that. How many times in your life have you said, I deserve to be happy? I deserve this because I've worked hard. But the truth is, and I've said it many times, you don't deserve oxygen. But let me tell you what you do deserve, and think about it just a second. You deserve eternal death and separation from God your Father, because you sinned against Him. But He gave us eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Wow, what a privilege, what a right, what a blessing. And the second son, the older son, was one who... At first looked like he was doing things right, but then we realized his self-hypocrisy and everything. We realized his selfishness. But the thing that I find so exciting about this story is the fact that that father could love that prodigally, that he could love that compassionately, that unconditionally, that even though his sons would spit in his face and say, I'm not going to do what you want to do. I don't want anything but your money. I wish you were dead. He continues to love them. And when we compare that to God, our Heavenly Father, He loves us so much more. He loves us despite, because He is holy and righteous, despite the fact that we spit in His face and choose to reject Him, the fact that we nailed His Son to a tree, He continues to love us so extravagantly. And that's what I want to talk more about today in basically just John 3.16. But I'll start with a story. There was a son who was going to graduate high school. He loved his father. He spent time with his father. And he told his father he wanted a new truck for graduation. So his father and him went out and they looked at trucks. They did this for several weeks. 
maybe even months before time for his graduation. Well, graduation day came, and the son was expecting that new truck, right? Because sometimes we expect God to answer our prayers just the way we want. We expect Him to be a vending machine where we put in the money and we choose this and out that pops. Well, on that graduation day, his father came out to him and handed him a gift-wrapped Bible. The son got so upset that he threw the Bible down in the dirt, walked away, never to speak to his father again. Years later, his father died. And the son was notified and he came back to go through the possessions of the father. And while he was going through his possessions, he found that Bible. He wiped the dust off of it and looked into the Bible. And it was uh, addressed to him. His father said how much that he loved him. That he was so proud of him. And that his love for him was unconditional. And right in that crease was a check, a cashier's check, dated that day for the amount of money for the truck that they had picked out. Now, I don't know how you would feel if that were you or anything, but I'll compare that to our relationship with God. He wants to give us so much, but so many times we don't think He's given us what's best for us because we don't have His vision in His hindsight. We don't see the eternal consequences. And we refuse to give to take what He's offering us. And what that young uh, man was being offered by his father was something so valuable. Not the truck, the Bible, the words of God were so important. But he gave him that blessing that he wanted also in the truck. But the son refused and walked away and never knew that blessing till it was too late. Thing is, it's never too late for us. No matter what we do, no matter what position you're in, no matter where you're at in your life, God loves you. And all you have to do is turn to Him and just like the prodigal father, He'll come running to you with arms open wide. And He knows what's best for you. He knows how to comfort you. He knows what makes you tick because He created you and He loves you so unconditionally and so extravagantly. He loves you enough that He sent His own Son to die for your sins, to die in your place. Will you accept that gift and will you use it wisely? A gift is something that if you don't accept it, you'll never have it, right? That Son never accepted that gift. And then a gift also is something that you need to use. The Bible would have given him words of instruction for his whole life, guidance, peace. And that truck would have given him the immediate blessings that he was desiring at that time. But he didn't accept that gift, so he never could use the gift. If he would have accepted it, he would need to use it or it wouldn't be of any value to him. So Jesus died in your place. He died and rose again so that you could have life. Life beginning now. Not just beginning when you die but life now. You belong to Him. He bought you back with a price. John 3.16 in the King James Version says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. This verse begins with God and ends with eternal life. That's what He's offering you. He is the Creator, the author of all life. And He wants to give you life eternal with Him the way He created you in the beginning, the way He designed you to spend eternity with Him, to have a loving relationship with Him. In your bulletins, I came up with some ideas because I was thinking about it, and I was like, the, God's love is for you, you, the letter U. So I thought of some things that would help me remember and think even more of what God did for me. For God so loved, that's unimaginable. It is love beyond belief or description. Who did He love? The world. It's unconditional. It's available to all. Rich or poor, black or white, male or female, everyone is loved. That He gave unselfish love. It is love that gives rather than receives. His only begotten Son, what an utterly costly thing that was. It is love that sacrifices something, beloved, something precious, something of great value. That whosoever, it's unselective, it is love for anyone, whoever accepts it freely, regardless of anything they've done, regardless of who they are. That whosoever believeth in Him, it's undeserving, it is love that you do not deserve. All you have to do is believe and accept it. Should not perish, 
It's unburdened. It is love that releases us from the penalty of sin and gives life instead of death. But have everlasting life. It is a life, a love that is unending, never fails. Instead, we have eternal life instead of what we deserve, which is eternal punishment. We have eternal life with God. So another story I want to tell you. There's a, there was an old lady in northern Idaho that she wanted power to her house. And, you know, she lived way back. They didn't want to bring power to her or anything. So she went through all kind of trouble to get power run out to her house. Finally, after a lot of trouble, a lot of petitioning, a lot of effort, the electricity company ran power to her house. Well, a few months afterwards, they were looking at the meter reading at the bill, and they're like, what's going on here? We don't see any power usage. So they sent a meter reader up to check the power, see what was going on. He read the meter, and he's like, well, it's right and everything. So he asked the lady, he said, are you not using any power? She said, yeah, I'm using power. She said, I turn it on every time my lamps go out and I have to relight them. I turn it on so I can see. If we don't tap into the power that we have in this life, what Jesus did for us and the spirit that he left for us, then we're never going to experience a life that we could have on this earth. And what a shame that would be. We have to tap into the power that God gave us. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 15-19 through 19 reads, And He died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for Him who died for them and was raised again. That's what we're supposed to live for. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. Now, not later. The old has gone and the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to Himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. We're supposed to do the same that God was reconciling the world to Himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And He has committed to us the message of reconciliation. That's why Jesus came, to free us, but not only to free us, but so that we could go spread the gospel message, that we could tell others that that's why Jesus came, that they died for their sins as well, so we could bring them and escort them into the way of life. John 3.16 was for you, for me, was for everyone. It is a gift from God because of who He is, not because of who we are. So I'd like to look at that verse and explain it a little bit better in depth. For God, so who is God to you? God is different to different people. Is He someone that you trust completely for your needs and desires, for everything that matters in your life, or do you trust Him when He answers prayers your way? Is He someone that you love back unconditionally? Or is He someone that you love conveniently when it's not sacrificial to you or anything? Is He someone that you have confidence that He will answer your prayers? Or do you lack the confidence that He really cares about you and your needs? Is He someone that you love enough to give your life to? Or someone that you want to half-heartedly commit to? God means different things to different people. But in this case, God refers to the sovereign deity who made everything, who is everything. I am. That is the God who is talking here. The God that is in control of all things, that does love unconditionally. And He loves you so much. Four is a conjunction. Are you familiar with what a conjunction is? Do you remember? Oh yes, you know what I'm talking about. Do you remember the little Saturday morning show, Conjunction Junction, what's your function? Well, we've got a little video that will remind you if you don't remember. Thank you, Logan. Do you remember that? Does it bring back any memories? 
does for me. They had all kind of them. They had adverbs and stuff where the little girl smacks her toe or something and goes, ouch, you know, and then says the rest. But anyway, a conjunction connects something. So what is it connecting here? Well, we've got to look back to see what it's connecting. So if we look at John 3, 14 and 15, it says, Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in Him. Then we read 4. So it's connecting that. That's what it's connecting. Because what Jesus had to go through, that is why God did it. Why God did what He had to do. We could not save ourselves. So He had to make a way. And His way was to lift Jesus Christ up. Condemn Him for your sins, for my sins. Once and for all. Because that's what it would take to appease our sin against a holy and righteous God. Conjunction, junction, what's your function? Well, I'm so thankful here for that function because it connects us to eternal life. Jesus was talking to Nicodemus in John 3 and He was explaining to him what must happen. And He said that a man must be born again before he can see the kingdom of heaven. And then He goes on to explain. And so often we quote John 3.16... And maybe we really think about what we're quoting. And it, is, it does sum up God's love and the gospel message. But you've got to take to heart what it truly means. What God did for us. What it means to believe. What Jesus did for us. Jesus is the reason. Jesus came to die for us and do something that we could not do for ourselves. Because God, the one and only, loved us enough to do this for us. And if you believe, then it should be a life that shows that you believe. So let's look at the verse a little bit more in depth. For God so, so is an adverb expressing the idea of God's infinite love for every single person. There's no exceptions. He loves every single one. He loves them extravagantly, beyond imagination. It's hard enough to fathom the prodigal father and how he would run out and love his son with a pig slop and everything on him with the things that he did. And then he would love the other son just as much when he was selfish and pouting and saying, I'm not going to do what you say, Father. He loved him just the same. But how a holy, righteous, omnipotent God could love us is just beyond my recognition. But he does. He loves us so much. And He longs so much for us to be reconciled back to Him. And when you just sit there and think about it, that's incredible that He would love you that much. That He would love myself that much. It's hard to fathom. But all you have to do is accept it. For God so loved, He loved us deeply, fondly, compassionately. He desires the loving relationship with each and every one of His children. He is lovingly fond of everyone, regardless of what they do, regardless of their behavior, regardless of their deeds or their actions. He loves them because He is God, not because anything that we've ever done. So it doesn't matter how much you give, how much you don't give, God loves you because He is God. For God so loved the world, just like the prodigal father, God came to you. You didn't have to come to Him. All other religions require you to come to God. If you do this, if you do that, then maybe you can achieve. And the bad thing is, is a lot of times you don't know what that maybe is, so there's always that doubt. Well, God is God, and He came to you because of who He is. And you just have to accept it. For God so loved the world that which means therefore as a result of His inconceivable love for every person, of who He is that He gave to show how great that He is, to show His deity, to show His compassion. And He would give something of such great value that we absolutely positively do not deserve, that we absolutely positively could not obtain on our own. He offers it to those who accept it. What does He offer? His only begotten Son. Many translations say one and only Son or only Son. Because in our 
terminology today, we want to take begotten as meaning created, something that was created. But if you go back to the root word, the original Greek word is monogenes, which means to be one of a kind with a specific relationship, unique in kind. Jesus was God's Son, unique. There is no other. He had a unique relationship with His Father. And if we take that to what we can understand, I cannot understand how someone could give their Son for me. Maybe themselves, maybe someone they didn't know, but I can't see how they would give their Son. And to take that to a God level, how much more that that action involved, that He gave His Son for you and I. Jesus is the only way. He's the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through Him. No one else is like Him. There is no other way to be reconciled to the Father. That whosoever, we have that word that again, which means therefore. So as a result of this gift, God gives the sacrifice of Jesus in your place so that you don't have to anymore. That you can't do it in the first place. It's something that God did once and for all for you. That whoever chooses to believe can have this gift. But just like the son I mentioned first, you have to choose this gift. And then what are you going to do with that gift if you choose it? It's only because of God and who He is that He sent His Son Jesus. That whosoever believeth in Him, the Greek word used here is pisteo, which means believe completely. And there's where I think when we read this verse that we lose the power of this verse. Because we just say, whoever believes. And we take that as, well, I believe that the sun's shining today. We don't take it as it changing your life, as something you commit to. Because of the love that God had and what He did for you, that you truly believe, that you choose to follow Him, that your life chooses to show it. It means complete confidence to entrust, absolute faith and trust, to give yourself up completely and commit to whatever it is. John uses this word a hundred different times in the book of John and 1 John. You think he's trying to get his point across? What it means to truly believe? It doesn't just mean, I believe in Jesus Christ, therefore I'm saved. James uses the same verse In James 2, 18 and 19, he says, But someone will say, You have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God, good, even the demons believe and shudder. Same word. The demons believe, but they're not saved, are they? It's a difference in how you take that verb. How you believe. Do you believe enough to commit your life to it? To realize what God did for you? His love for you? James goes on to say, like I said, that if you don't have the actions, he doubts your belief. If you truly believe and you're still breathing oxygen, then you should be living a life that brings glory and honor to God. Why? Because of what He did for you. Because of who He is, not who you are. Because how much He loved you. Even in your sin and deprivation, He came to you. And He gave a gift of His Son. Such an incredible gift. Not just gave Him up, but He was brutally humiliated and murdered for us. For each and every one of us. So that we could be saved. And then He rose again so that we could have life starting now. And then live life eternal for all eternity. What a blessed reward. Luke 9.26, these are Jesus' words. They say, Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when He comes in His glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. Do you truly believe? Do you profess Jesus Christ? Not just in words, but like James says, in actions. If you don't, Jesus says He'll deny you. Those are His words. Back to John 3.16, it says, Should not perish. That's from the Greek word apilimai. I don't know if I pronounced it right or not. 
which means to completely sever, destroy, and cut off from something. Complete destruction and total removal. You deserve death, eternal death and punishment for sinning against God. But because of Jesus Christ, you don't have to worry about anything if you accept. It's been destroyed once and for all. Sin has no power over you. And you will not spend eternity paying for your sins. Instead, you will be restored as a rightful son and heir of God the Father because of who He is, because of what Jesus did. You don't have to worry at all. There's 100% peace and joy because nothing can change what Jesus did. He destroyed it, utterly destroyed death and the power Satan had once and for all. There is no more fear. It says, should not perish. The word perish is from the same word. And then not means complete and utter denial. It connects the two together. There is not, not only is there no way, there's no way it connects them together. Absolutely no way that anything can undo what Jesus Christ did for you. But just like the man that I mentioned first, you have to accept what he did. You have to believe and you have to use that gift. But have everlasting life. There's that word but that I usually hate, but in this case I love it. Because it's that conjunction that connects should not perish with but have everlasting life. It's the complete opposite of that we should not perish. Not only do we not die, that wouldn't that be good enough? We don't have to die forever eternally in hell. But instead, He gave a precious, precious thing. Now we have eternal life with our Father forever and ever. Something that will not end. When we live this life, it's not even that compared to eternity, which He gives us forever with the Father. I just can't fathom it, but it's just so joyful. Each and every one of us is presented with a decision though, aren't we? Will we accept that gift? Or will we throw that Bible in the mud? Will we accept the gift of our Father and live a life accordingly? Or do we think that He doesn't have our best in mind? He has absolutely the best in store for you. He knew you before you ever came out of your mother's womb. He has plans for you. He knows the number of hairs on your head. But sometimes we think our ways are more important. That our ways are right. That He doesn't want the best for us. So we don't want to give up ourselves. When we've got to deny. Scripture's clear. We must become a servant of all if we want to accept it. Look at what God did for us. Just in this one verse, taking one verse out of Scripture. How awesome and good and loving the Father is for His children. John 14, Jesus says these words. Verse 12, He says, Verily, or excuse me, Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in Me will do works I have been doing. Skip down to verse 15, it says, If you love Me, keep My commands. Verse 21 says, Whoever has My commands and keeps them is the one who loves Me. Verse 23 says, Jesus replied, Anyone who loves Me will obey My teaching. Verse 24, he says, Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. If you believe John 3.16, are you living a life like Jesus said? All of us have areas of improvement. Does your life show that you appreciate what God did for you? Have you accepted Him as your Savior? Are you living a life that brings glory and honor to Him? If not, will you start doing it today? If there's something you need to confess and give up, will you do that for Him? Look what He did for you. God gave His one and only Son, His precious Son, because of how much He lived you, loved you, to destroy your punishment forever. Nothing can change that. Nothing can bring you back to that utter destruction. But instead, He gives you the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ. Once heard a child that misquoted John 3.16. Instead of saying, 
only begotten son, because that's a little tough for small kids. The child said, his only forgotten son. Slip of the tongue, right? Precious child that did it. But it, that statement has so much truth to it. Because so many times in this world today, we as Christians live a life like Jesus has been forgotten. We say we believe, but we don't put the validity behind the belief. We don't put the passion behind the belief. So when others look at us, they make the statements like, well, you know, he's a nice guy and everything, but I know this guy over here who professes not to be a Christian who lives just as good a life. They equate it to our works because they don't understand who God is and how much God loves him. But how much different would that be if we lived a life that showed that we hadn't forgot about Jesus Christ? That we are so proud and thankful of what God did for us that our light shines immensely to those who don't understand. There was a guy named Joe. He was a drunkard. He was a sinner, just like you and I. People despised him because of how he acted because when he was drunk, he was just mean and nasty. One day, he figured out what John 3.16 was. He got saved. He came to the realization of what God had did for him. And he came to a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. After that, his life changed. It was evident. He started teaching young kids about Jesus Christ. He spent his time compassionately doing that. It was obvious that Joe loved the Lord. Then one day in church, an evangelist came through. And the kids had to stay in big church rather than in children's church because there was a guest speaker. And they gave the um, altar call and the evangelist asked if anyone wanted to come know Jesus Christ as their Savior. Well, a little kid came forward and he cried out to God. He said, forgive me, Father. I want to become saved. Make me like Joe. Make me like Joe. And the evangelist said, don't you mean make me like Jesus? And the little kid said, yeah, that works, because Jesus Christ was a lot like Joe. (laughs) Now, wouldn't that be cool? If your life reflected Jesus Christ that much, that other people said Jesus Christ was like you? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, His one and only Son, for each and every one of you. Will you accept that and will you live a life that brings glory and honor to the Father? Let's bow our heads. Father, I thank you so much. Easter reminds me of what you did for me. And I just meditate on your scriptures. The love that you have, that's unfathomable. I can't conceive the prodigal father, let alone my prodigal father in heaven, how much he loves me. Father, thank you so much. When I look at my life, I think, what does anything here on earth matter? Because what you did for me. Father, I pray that each and every one of us realizes that and lives a life that will bring glory and honor to you. Because you have done so much for us. And we thank you for that. We could have never done it on our own, so you came to us. And you lovingly gave us the life of your Son in the place of ours. We thank You so much for that love and we thank You for being able to have power over sin in this earth and for the glorious reward that we're going to receive when we get to spend eternity with You. I just thank You because You are the great I Am and I lift up my voice to sing praises to You. In Jesus' name, Amen.